you open your Bibles to John, the 13th chapter. We're in the upper room discourse. We're in the upper room discourse. Which goes from chapter John. It's the longest. Now, all of them record it, but this is the longest. Sometimes this, uh, I refer to the upper room discourse. Some people refer to, I'm talking about what was taught. This is what's called the Last Supper uh, also. Maybe your Bible, uh, study Bible, might show you as we open uh, John 13 that is called the Last Supper. Um, and that's how it's often referred to. You will hear me refer to it as a upper room discourse as I'm teaching lessons from it, at which we're going to do today. Remember last time when we talked to you that we said that there were uh, seven Truly, truly, that's the series we're in for those who are with us on the Internet. We're in a series called Truly, Truly out of the book of John. And John introduced it as a new teaching technique. And that was the doubling of the amen, truly, truly, or verily, verily, the King James might say. Uh, amen, amen. And it comes from the Old Testament. John shows that it was a, an enormous teaching mechanism that Jesus used uh, to teach uh, in very important messianic doctrines that Jesus would fulfill either in the first or second coming. Now, when we get to um, when we get to John 13, we're going to the upper room discourses. We're going from 13 through 17. That's a large chunk of scripture uh, for what's called the Last Supper. And now we're at the we're at the point of the crucifixion. When he's going to leave the supper, he's going to go out into the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be arrested. He's going to go through Jewish trials, Roman trials. Uh, Jewish trials will be held at night. Early in the next morning, he will go through uh, 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 Roman trials, and he'll be crucified the next day. Uh, you're familiar with him on the cross for six hours. That that's, will be that. So... <clears throat> He, what he does, and it's really important, and these, these seven are the biggies. Uh, these doctrines that he's going to give at the Last Supper are apropos for the church age. Now, last time, and I, I recorded, look at, we have, look at the top of your, not at the very top, but towards the introduction of your paper, we got 13 chapter verse 6, just here are the seven. Last week, we talked about 16. We're in 20, then 21, 38. Then we go to the 14th chapter, verse 12. We go to the 16th chapter, and we got 20 and 21. And even though those verses seem to be close together, they're all separate messianic doctrines that are important. Today, uh, we're looking at the reception of the gospel of Christ out of uh, John 13, 18 through 20. Uh, and um, you'll see how important that is in verse 20. Just look down to verse 20 a moment, then I'm going to have a word of prayer. Verse 20 is where my truly, truly is. See that truly, truly I say to you. Now, the verses I'm going to talk about is 18, 19, and 20. But look at truly, truly I say to you, that's where we're going. He who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. Now, here's what's important. Notice there are four receives. Do you see that? One, two, three, four. Now, you're familiar, at least through my teaching, that when you find um, word, dominant words in a passage, we call them markers. I mean, they're there specifically. This is Lombano. It's used four times. And the word sen is, is um, pimple, P-E-M, pimple, is P-E-M-P-O. The word sent, it's used twice. And I can't tell you how important that is to this messianic doctrine. This is really important. And, and uh, that's, where, that's where the word receive is where I get the title of our lesson, the reception of the gospel of, of Christ. Okay. So that's, that's the dynamics of it. And the, the Greek syntax, 
which I'll show you in verse 20. The Greek syntax of that verse is out of sight. Uh, the way it fits together in the Greek language is really phenomenal. Well, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our morning study. Al pretty much covered it. You can't study the Bible in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be, as he said, mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins, at least in those three categories. <clears throat> And uh, if you're aware of that, both by conscience and by conviction uh, of the Holy Spirit, you've grieved him and quenched him, <clears throat> then the way to get back into fellowship, into the dynamics of the indwelling, filling power of the Holy Spirit is to confess your sins under, according to 1 John 1, 9. And, and, and it, it's a passage that deals with sanctification, not salvation. It deals with the ministry of the Holy Spirit in context of 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's have this word of prayer and we'll get into our morning study. I give you this moment. Father, we're so thankful today for your grace and mercy and love. And I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of this messianic doctrine to us, this idea of the receiving and the sending, the receiving of the gospel and then the sending of those who have received it. We call that in the church age, we call this whole concept later by Paul's teaching, we call it ambassadorship of reconciliation. Ambassadors with the message of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians 5. I pray, Father, that would be our heart's message today. Bring it to our people that they may take it to those who are in need of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's go back to our passage and notice I'm going to begin with a three-point homiletical outline of these three passages that dominate, at least in my heart, on my lesson. It is the scriptures. Now, re remember, when you have a capital S and we're in the Gospels, he's talking about the Old Testament his name. New Testament was written, yeah. So when you have a capital F scriptures, you're talking about the canonization of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. And so that's in verse 18, for me that dominates. And then verse 19, I, I called it the scoop. A scoop, you know, like a news scoop. A scoop is information of, of immediate interest, a scoop. And you're going to see that in at least in the heart of Christ as he teaches this. And then I'm going to focus on the word sender. And so I have my three S words in this passage. So let's go to look, look at verse 18 uh, of the 13th chapter. And I wrote this out in your passage because I want to call your attention to certain Greek words that make this very important. I do not speak to all of you. What is he, what is he, now he's got his 12 disciples. When he says, I'm not speaking to all of you, look at the 13 chapter, verse 11, where he's already brought this up at the foot washing deal. He's already brought this up. Uh, when they talked about foot washing versus bathing. Remember that? Foot washing versus bathing in verse 11. For, uh, you know, Jesus and Peter gets in this conversation. In verse 10, he who has a bath needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. Look at verse 11. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. Now, he comes back to that subject, right? He comes back to the subject. The one that's going to betray him, he's going to talk about that. Now, he's not going to identify him, but he's going to say, I know who it is. Right? There's two people that know who it is, and he lets the person that's going that listen. He's going to he's going to say to the person who has already betrayed him. And before Jesus comes out of Gethsemane, he's going to step into Geth, uh, uh, Gethsemane and give him a betrayer's kiss, right? That famous kiss. All right, so. When, when in our, in verse 18, when we're in verse 18, he says, I do not speak 
to all of you, that's what he's talking about. And, and as it unfolds, you will see as he tells it. Then he uses the word, I know. It's oida. It's always, when you have oida, it's always in the perfect tense. In fact, it became a word from that. And it means there's something that I know that's not debatable. What I know is the absolute truth. It's absolutely 100% true. Okay? I know. Is that, it, it, that by, the, by the way, in, um, in verse 11 that we quoted, he used it there too. When he says, I know, or I knew. I know. I know the ones, watch he says, I know the ones I have chosen. See, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. I know the ones I have chosen. That's an aorist tense. Notice that's an aorist middle indicative. But this is what we call an adversive conjunction or in contrast. But it is that, Hina with a divine purpose, but it is according to the divine purpose of the plan of God that the scriptures be fulfilled. And now he's going to quote Psalms 41, 9. This is the messianic scripture that's going to be fulfilled at the last supper. Not in the garden where he kisses. At the last supper. Now watch. I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that divine purpose of the scriptures that the scriptures may be fulfilled. And he quotes Psalms 41, 9. He who eats my bread lifted up, notice that's in aorist tense, his heel against me. Now, where, where, where is this going to, where, where is this going to take place? At a dinner, right? They're eating. He who eats my bread, not I eat his bread, he who eats my bread, who sits at my table. You know, we do the Eucharist, God and man at table are set down. It's a great song. This is what it's about. He who put his feet under my table and ate my bread came in as a close friend of mine, has already set in motion betrayal of me. See, watch this. See the word eat? It's a present tense in the Greek. See the word lifted up? That's an aorist tense. That's past tense. That's a, this is a point in time when this took place before the present tense. I'm eating with somebody right now. We're passing bread. You've come in here as a friend and sat at my table, welcomed by me to, and you've become my enemy. You're already my enemy. You have already made a deal against me. Aorist tense. And in doing this, you're going to fulfill Psalms 41.9. He quotes the Psalms. He doesn't make this up. This is, this is scripture being fulfilled. Look, listen to me now. I can't, I'd step over there and say I want to step out of the pulpit for a minute, but I can't because then I lose internet people. Let me just change my hat for a moment and speak to you. You know why you're here today? Study the word of God. You know what that's called? That's called the scriptures. And you know what God wants out of that scripture? Fulfillment. And he's going to get it. Whether you go positive to it or negative to it, the scripture is going to be filled. Look, there's two points of the scripture. Once he said the scripture is going to be fulfilled, on the one part, Christ is going to fulfill his role as the Messiah. On the other part, Judas is going to fulfill his role as a betrayer. And both are involved in volition. 
Both have a choice. Both have a choice. And let me tell you, you learn the scriptures. It's God's desire that you bring that scripture to fulfillment in a positive way in the plan of God. But listen, either way is going to be fulfilled, either, either in a negative or, or a positive truth. So you shouldn't be surprised when you come to church and study this stuff and then God asks it be to, to be applied to your life. It should be, there should be no like, oh, I have a brain freeze here. The whole idea is to all scripture is God breathed. All scripture is God breathed, inhaled, exhaled in our life. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. Now, how you play that role is very important. You can play the role like Jesus in fulfilling it, or you can play the role like Judas in fulfilling it. Right? They both fulfilled it. The scripture today is going to be fulfilled, one in a positive way, one in a negative way. You understand that? And all of it's based on volition. Be on the winning side, okay? Not on the losing side. You have a choice. You don't have to be a loser. You have a choice. I mean, sometimes in the game of life, you just get beat. You give your best effort and get beat. Mississippi State, that happened to them yesterday. Well, I don't know where that team came from. <clears throat> I mean... If I hadn't been an Alabama fan, I would have said, That's, that, what a sad day this was for this, this team to put so much on the field and not win that game. But listen, this way, listen, we're all winners. We're all winners. They say, you choose the word of God. You walk by faith. Faith will fulfill its role in the plan of God in a positive way, not in a negative way. Look, you can't get away from the Word of God once it settles in your soul. It's there, and it's either going to go out positive or negative in your life. Either you're going to refuse to do it and pay the consequences, or you're going to do it and get the rewards. And someday, you'll sit at the judgment seat of Christ, and this message will ring a bell. Apparently, it's not ringing one now, so nothing I can do about that. He who eats, and that's an interesting word. Listen, there, this is not the typical word for eat, which is interesting. There, there is a typical word for eat. This is not it. This is trogo. This is T-R-O-G-O, trogo. And it means to munch or, or better at a meal to, to chew your food. You know, we got little kids. Oh, man, I got so you. My mother, when I was a little, my grandmother too, I guess it just went through the family, that you had to chew it 20 times. You remember that? Did you grow up with somebody say you got to chew your food 20 times? <laughs> there are very few boys ever that chew their food 20 times. A girl may. About two bites and is gone. And mother would say, and gra my grandmother too, both would say, R Ronnie, chew your food 20 times. I think, it will take me forever to eat this meal. I mean, 20, 20 times is like 20 minutes to me or something. But this is the word that's used there. It means to chew. Uh, if it wasn't at a good meal, it would mean to munch. It means to chew. He was chewing his food. He was setting, he was comfortable. You know, when you're having a good time, you chew your food uh, slower, don't you? Because Every, everybody's talking. You're having a good time. People laughing, talking, having a good time, and you eat a little bit, laugh a little bit. Your stomach says, oh, thank you. This is good for me. This is what this... This word is indicating that there was, this was a nice, relaxed time. Now, listen, everybody's having a good time. Everybody's talking about what's been going on in their life, and they're laughing, and Peter's telling jokes. You know he's telling jokes, don't you? 
Have you ever heard about the one? That's, that's going to be Peter telling you. And so people are laughing. They're having a good time. They got nothing. They got, the, you know, this is like the weekend. This is, you know, nobody's stressed out. Everybody's having a good time except for Jesus, knowing there's a betrayer. There's two people that are unhappy at the meal. One is, one is a phony baloney. He's acting like the close friend, as the writer of Psalm says, a close friend acting like a close friend who has already betrayed him, and tonight he's going down. It's already been set up. Jesus knows it. You know what's interesting about the person that knows it? He's got a relaxed mental attitude, and the other one doesn't. You know why? Because one is letting the word of God roll over him the way it was designed to go. This is going to be ex exercised in my life because my desire is to please the Father. Depends on who you please in life, how your life goes. You know that, don't you? He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel. Isn't that interesting? That comes right out of, that comes right out of Genesis 3.15, the spiritual warfare has lifted up his heel against me. In other words, we understand you know, there's a lot of ways you can get hit about the worst one in the whole world to get kicked. With a farm boy, you learn how to approach animals. All you have to do is let a young calf kick you one time and you have respect for the big ones. I can tell you that. He who eats my bread has lifted. Eating is a present tense, and the aorist tense is a pastime. And not only that, but this is an active voice. It's an aorist active indicative, and the active voice is the voice of volition. In other words, he's lifted up. He's already acted upon this free will, free will, free will. Listen to me, free will, Judas is carrot has taken his free will and put it in bondage to evil. You can give it to good and God, or you can give it to evil and the devil, but your mind will go someplace. Your free will goes someplace every day you make choices. You either make them for God or you make them for the world. There's no independent. Once you learn the word of God, applying the, what you've learned to your life is where the secret of the Christian power is. You walk by faith. You walk by the power of the Holy Spirit. Both of these are the power engines that run the Christian life. And every day you're making decisions. Listen, every day you're talking to yourself about something. That ought to be a three-way conversation. It shouldn't be a two-way. It shouldn't be just between you and you. It ought to be between you, your conscience, and Christ. For me to live is Christ. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live in the power of the Son. Well, in verse 19, from now, watch these words now. Watch these words, because here's the scoop. Information of immediate interest. Watch this now. He just said this. He just said there's a betrayer in the room. Listen to what he says now. From now on, watch this. From now on, watch this now, before it comes to pass, so when it does occur, you may believe. Do you see all that? Do you see all that stuff? Listen, from now on, that's time. I'm going to tell you, I'm telling you, from now on, I'm telling you, before it comes to pass, see, that's time stuff. This is how your life is lived. It's lived in segments of time, Right? You get out of bed, I got to go to work, I got a schedule. I eat lunch, I got a schedule. I go home, I got a schedule. It's all about how you live your life out in time, and your time is in segments. Listen, here's he said, from now on, I am telling you, present tense, before it comes to pass, so that when it does come to pass, you will believe that I am he, Christ. That I am the subject of Psalms 41.9.
I'm going to be betrayed in fulfillment of Psalms 41.9. I'm going to be betrayed by somebody that I'm eating dinner with that declares himself to be a close friend of mine who has already, already made a deal to sell me out. And I'm going to tell you from now on, before it comes to pass, when it does come to pass, you will believe that I am Christ. So we all get a chance to go to Bible study and learn before so that when it comes to pass, we will believe what we learned in Bible study. This is how this stuff works, people. And I'll tell you, when it doesn't work in your life is when you sit in here like you did used to do at your home and it goes in one ear and goes out the other. It never takes residence. You come to Bible study, when you learn and the Word of God is planted in your soul, it's for, it's for that to be occupied by your presence with it. So many come to this church. They're fed good word of God. Listen to me. You let it go one, one, one ear and out the other. It never takes up residence in your life. Your life, your life still sucks. That's what the kids say. That's teen talk. That's your choice. <laughs> That's your choice. And when that happens, then the word of God is fulfilled in a negative way in your life. It's, it's pitiful, but that's the way it is. It is interesting to me that Jesus, the one betrayed, and the betrayer are close friends. That's what we learn from the Psalms. When Jesus discussed this out of Luke's recall, Luke 22, 21 through 23 says, but woe to the man by whom he's betrayed. Jesus said, but woe to the one who betrays Christ. The sender, this is where the truly, truly comes. Note two, watch this. Watch the two senders. He who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So we got God the Father and God the Son in a dy dynamic tool of sending, sending, right? Right? This works enormously in ambassadorship. The Lord, the head of the church, the savior of the body, sends members of the church as ambassadors of Christ. He, he teaches them. He, he equips them. He supports them. He sends them. And what they do out there is fulfilling the Father's plan. They go out there and they preach the message of reconciliation, which we'll talk in the second hour. He who receives whom, whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. You know what's other dynamic about this? You can't see this, all the dynamics, but in three verses, you've got 18 verbal forms. Now, those of us who study Greek or Hebrew, we look for verbs. We go through and lay it out. The first thing we do is we identify verbs and pull them out, and then we lay it out and take a look at it because they're the engine that run the car. No matter how good the car looks, it's got to be able to get us from point A to point B. 
<clears throat> and so that's one of the first things we do. We, we pull them out and take a look at it. We, uh, you know, we kick the tires and check the oil and things. And when you do this, you will find there are 18 Greek verbal forms and three verses. That's a lot. You might read a verse sometimes, don't even have a verb in it. <laughs> I, 18 in three verses. That's a lot. This shows a lot of verbal, mental, and doctrinal information passing between the teacher and the students. It don't look like much until you study it. Then you go like, whoa. And what it does, it just shows a lot of stuff going on at this supper, a lot of verbal, a lot of mental thinking, a lot of stuff's going on. I mean, this is a lot of stuff's going on at this dinner. That's what I love about our family when we get together, as we'll do today. Um, everybody's laughing. Everybody's having a good time as a rule. If not, we call time out and try to find out what's going on so we can get back to foolishness. Here's my second point before our break. We have two Greek marker words in our truly, truly Messianic doctrine of 1320. The first one is the word receive, which is lambano, and the other second Greek word is pempo, the word send. One is the word receive and the other send. Lampano is used four times in the Greek syntax to teach two important doctrinal principles. Teach two important doctrinal principles. First, he who received is the unsaved. He who receives, and there's a definite article, ho, that's not getting you ready for Christmas. That's a definite article in the Greek language. He who receives, present active participle, he who receives whomever Whomever, that, that's in the, I don't have time to explain the Greek syntax. I did lay it out there for the Greek students. So whomever is just an interesting word to put in there with a combination of antish. That, that's just interesting. Whomever, and, th and that is because of volition. Listen, he who receives whomever I sends, here's an unbeliever, and here's a person with the message of hope, of salvation through grace, through Christ, is sent to him, the person now, that per, the, the, the person who's going to receive and the person who's been sent has a moment. Now we have somebody that's become a, watch this, who's become a whomever. It's kind of like in the old King James, they used to, John 3, 16, it would say, whosoever whosoever, right? You would see this word, whosoever, whosoever believes. Well, see, there's a moment here when you got an unbeliever who's positive to God that is now God wants to give a gospel hearing to in the plan of God, wants to give him a gospel hearing, and here's a person who is sent by the Lord by God, by the Lord, right, who's in charge of this deal, sent it them when they meet, when the person who wants to hear the gospel and the person who wants to give the gospel meet, we've got a whomever. And that's a, that's a great moment of opportunity for both of them, the one who wants and the person who desires them to be saved. That's quite a moment. Do you know that? Quite a moment in your life, wasn't it? I mean, it was an unforgettable moment in my life. Unforgettable. Listen, he who receives, present active participle, whomever I send, receives me. Now look, watch this now. Watch syntax. Here's Greek syntax. He who receives whomever I send, that's a present active participle. Receives me is a present active indicative. Here's this Greek syntax. The action of the present participle and the present, present indicative occur at the same time. The present indicative is the main verb. And the dynamics of the main verb is why they were sent to receive Christ. 
you can't receive Christ unless there's a person that has a desire to hear it and a person has a desire to share it. And when it happens, boom, you've got this dynamics called the presentation of the gospel to somebody who is interested in believing it. That whole deal is called ambassadorship for Christ. That we are ambassadors for Christ in 2 Corinthians 5. And listen, listen, you always have to have your awareness in your six feet of responsibility because you move into other people's area and other people move into your area. Somebody is always in your six feet of space. And when they do, whether you enter theirs or they enter you, this is a moment that you must consider why God has sent this and made this possible in your life. Then there are no accidents. And you will see how dramatic the present tense is in your life in this thing called evangelism or this thing called ambassadorship because that's exactly what went on. The second principle, that's the first principle. You got that down? Listen, the second principle in this dynamic of this Greek syntax, he who receives me, see that came out of the, out of the tail end. Notice it's got hole on the front of it. Are you with me? He who receives me, who is this who receives me? The guy that came out of, out of the first number one up there, right? Please tell me you see this. Look, he who receives whomever I send, it receives me. He who receives me, see, that came out of the first, first right? Go ahead. I, I don't mind working for my, my meal. He who receives me, watch this now, right? The one who receives me, how did he receive Christ? He believed the gospel. He believed that Jesus died for the sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. <laughs> believed it and he got saved. He received, salvation is receiving Christ. Jesus Christ is the package of great salvation. He who receives me, same Greek syntax, receives Lombano, present active indicative, receives him who sent me. Do you see that? When you got saved, you got saved because you were aware that Jesus Christ died for your sins and was buried and raised from the dead. Boom, I got saved. I, quote, received Christ. The moment you receive Christ, Christ receives you. That's called positional truth. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. That's the verse that introduces you to ambassadorship in verses 18 through 21, by the way. He who receives me receives, notice that's, the same syntax, present participle with a present indicative, boom, there it is. The moment you receive Christ, boom, you receive God. See, that's John 10, 28 through 30. Boom. That's exactly what it is. If you're in the hands of Christ, and you are if you believe, Christ is in the hands of God because you believe, you're in good hands, right? You're in the hands of Christ who is in the hands of God. The moment you believe in Christ, boom, you got God. No man can come to the Father except, boom, through Christ. And when you, when you come to Christ for salvation, boom, you got God. God is your Father from that day forever. hoo -ah. hoo -ah. Do you see that? Now watch this. Notice that the word, him who sent me, is an aorist tense. Do you see that? Now, everything else has been in the present. It's either been a present participle, working off a present indicative, but now we have, boom, an aorist. I don't know why I'm clapping. It's just... I just I'm into the boom right now. 
Watch this now. You know why it goes back to the Father? Because that's where it originated. Eris tense takes us all the way back to the eternal life conference. We're back to the Father where it originated. It originated with the Father. Second Peter 3, 9, it is God's desire that none perish, but all come to repentance. Come on now. God the Father. Well, I want you to turn to John 10. I want to show this. This is point three. I'm going to do point three, and then we're going to take a break. Look at point three. And putting Lombano and Pempo together, do just what I just taught you. But here it is in John. This is point three. This is John 10. Now, I've been 13 of John. This is John 10. Look at 28, 29, and 30, because this is what he's talking about now. This is being played out in your conversion. This is what happens when you get saved. This is all about, this happened to every person here to believe the moment, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, this is how this thing worked. Here's what it says. I give eternal life to them. That's a gift. See the word give? That's the word gift. The concept of gift is I give. Ditto me. It's the word, for, it's a concept of gift. Like Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a, say it people, gift. It is a gift, not of works. It is a gift. This is the concept behind that. I give eternal life to them. They shall never perish. If you have eternal life, you'll never perish because John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that's whomever, wh whoever believes in him should what? Not perish. You know why? Because he's got eternal life. See, what happens the moment you are saved you are under perishing conditions. One of the 13 judicial charges of Adamic sin is perishing. The moment you believe perishing is removed, eternal life is put in its place. There's an exchange. There's an exchange. That's the whole message behind the 50 things you receive at salvation. You can never lose in time and eternity. It's the exchange. I mean, what, what a wonderful salvation God has offered us by faith through grace. Saved by grace through faith. Saved by grace through faith. It is a gift. You get it as a gift. You keep it as a gift because it comes from the character of God and not from the character of man. And I'm going to tell you, you ought to rejoice in that. Here's verse 28. I give eternal life to them. They shall never perish. And as a result, no man, no one shall snatch them out of my hand. As a result of what? Me going to the cross, establishing salvation by grace through faith. Every person who comes under those conditions, then there's an exchange made. All that Adam brought to your life is removed and everything Christ brings is put in its place. <laughs> Next verse. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one, no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. You see that? In the hands of Jesus, in the hands of God, boom. I mean, how eternal and secure can you be? Plus, the Holy Spirit is never able to leave you until either death or rapture. How about that? You talk about sealed up until the day of redemption? That sounds like a pretty good deal to me. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Do you get that? We have one hand. Do you understand that? We have one voice. We have one plan. We are one. And in Christ, you are one with them. 
if any man be in Christ, you are one with them. Let's have a word of prayer. This prayer will cover this half of the session. When we come back, we're going to talk about reconciliation, which is the message of ambassadorship. Father, we're thankful today for your grace and what your son provided for us that we might come into a welcomed relationship with you through grace. Through propitious work of Christ on the cross, extended to our life forever. What a magnificent John writes in, the, in his first John 2.2 2 about propitiation. The sins of the world have been propitiated. The sins of the world. Father, thank you. I pray today, Father, as we pause in the first hour to pray, we pray, Father, and thank you for sending your son in such a way that we could come into that program of grace and be united with you through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are there forever. No matter what the world tells us, <laughs> we are. Uh, we couldn't get out if we wanted to because we're in the hands of God. So, be better just to be content with it, wouldn't it, Father? And for the offering, pray, Father, we'd be good stewards of it. Spend as little on ourselves as we can and most on reaching the world for Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in John 13, 18 through 20. We looked at that in the first hour. And the whole idea <clears throat> in this verse 20 is important to us. <clears throat> That's where the truly, truly I say to you is, he, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and who receives me receives him who sent me. The reality of that brought out of the Christian life in application to us out of that Last Supper, what we call the Upper Room Discourse, this great discourse to us was the fact that we are to be ambassadors of Christ. We are to be ambassadors of Christ. The great emphasis on that is the word pimple, P-E-M-P-O, where I'm at point four. And uh, while I'm going there, if you'd look, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5. This is where we're, we talk about ambassadorship or the fulfillment of this concept that's established in the church age, this concept of, of receiving. Let me turn the fans on. Here we are uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5 where Paul introduces us to the concept of ambassador is how this truly, truly doctrine, messianic doctrine of the Last Supper, which uh, in verse 20 becomes reality to our life in uh, verse 18. Now, all these things are from God. Uh, and he's been in a heavy discussion on this. Um, now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. See, we talked about that. That's that set up at this Last Supper, right? I mean, if you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and who receives me is, uh, receives the one who sent me, right? Well, how that works out practically is described. Uh, now, all these things are from God. God who reconciles us to himself through Christ. See, that's... And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Um, this was his point. 
uh, and the upper room discourse, I mean, that, that how this is going to play out in church history is the great ministry of ambassadorship. I had a pastor friend one time that said, uh, and, I, and I think he had a great point on this, uh, ambassadorship, the ministry of ambassadorship is, is what you might think of as home missionaries in, in the sense of missionary work. Uh, but ambassadorship, I'm not quite sure. There's a lot of work that goes into missionary work. And if you're talking about uh, the gospel, then that would certainly be true. But this is about how, how we share our faith with other people uh, in this verse. Who, and the point is, who reconciles us to himself through Christ, God reconciles us to himself through Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And then he explains, namely, that God was in Christ. Isn't this interesting how this goes? God is in Christ reconciling the world. When you come to Christ, then Christ reconciles you to God. Did you get that? God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Then it goes the other way. Not counting their trespasses against them. That would be, for example, that would be 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin against us. And he has committed to us. Look, counted and committed. Look at those two words of ambassadorship. Counted and committed. Look. God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God in Christ reconciling the world himself through us. Not counting, their tresp not counting their trespasses against them. He has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. We're able to bring the message of reconciliation, which is the gospel. And the gospel is able to take all those transgressions away from their life. We're able to say, counting not the transgressions against you. Isn't that wonderful to be able to have the, the power of, of statement? To be able to say the person who gets saved that those 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin are removed from your life forever. In fact, the Bible calls them an exchange. The word behind, the key word behind the Greek word for reconciliation is exchange. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, but he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, notice verse 20. Now look at verse 17. Therefore, therefore. All right? When he says, when he goes to verse 17, therefore, is taking up a subject matter that is started in the fifth chapter. Verse 17 concludes that and opens up from that idea, therefore, in verse 17, is saying, now, I've taught you all that. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's new creation. All things have passed away and all things become new. Then he introduces through that, therefore, now all these things. Do you see that? Then he comes down to verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors. Now he's linked at those two, therefore, why for, you're right? Therefore is why for, have linked this whole thing up. They've linked the whole conversation up. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were entreating through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. He made him, this is still part of that 20, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That is the ministry that every one of us have. It's a wonderful ministry. And so I want to talk about reconciliation. The ministry of ambassadorship is the ministry of reconciliation. It's the primary message that we have. We give them the gospel, and then we tell them, you've just been reconciled to God, not counting your trespasses against you, right? Now, I want to give you six ideas behind this word 
reconciliation, right? Which I just read. Notice how many times, verse 18, reconciled, reconciliate, reconciled, reconciliation. Verse 19, reconciling, reconciliation. Verse 20, ambassadors for Christ, reconciling. Then he tells them how it's all possible in 21. The dominant word in there is reconciled, isn't it? We're always looking for dominance of what, what is the discussion. We are ambassadors of reconciliation. So the question is, what is reconciliation? So I want to give you, I want to give you six ideas behind this. Reconciliation, the word in this uh, katalagag is a word that carries the idea of exchange. Is an exchange or a change, kata, kata, is an exchange from a position in Adam. One idea is from a position in Adam to a position in Christ. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die, in Christ all are made alive. Agreed? In Adam. Now, we're all born in Adam. We have to be born again to be in Christ. How do I get out of Adam and get into Christ? The gospel is the power. The gospel that Christ came and died for our sins according to the scripture, was buried and raised from the dead according to the scripture, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Romans 1, 16 tells us that, that the gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. Then Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are we saved, not of ourselves. For by grace we are saved through faith in the gospel, not of works, least any man should boast, we are, we are saved as our salvation is a gift. It's a gift. So when we, when we, uh, when we take a look at what reconciliation is, we're, we're, and so I want, I want you to look at one other passage of Scripture. It's one that I really like that talk about this exchange in, a, in salvation. It's Colossians 1.13. I like it because it really tells you how you go from Adam into Christ in, in uh, Colossians 1.13. For he delivered or rescued. He delivered us from the domain of darkness. That's in Adam. He delivers us from the domain. He rescues us from the domain of darkness and transfers us into the kingdom of the beloved son. I mean, that's, that's the action of grace and salvation. When I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel has the power to rescue me from Adam and the 13 judicial charges, to, re to rescue me and to deliver me over here to transfer me into the position of Christ. That's, that's, the, that's behind the 50 things that you receive at salvation that you can never lose in time and eternity. For those who are with us with the internet, you can go to our internet, you pull down the 50 things, and you can follow along with that. But that's, a, that's an exchange the 13, we are rescued from that, and those 13 things that held us in bondage to Adam's sin are removed from us in that exchange. They're removed. We are no longer identified with that. We are removed from that, and we are transferred into a position in Christ. For example, the 20 status privilege. This is uh, 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 Paul, when he was talking about ambassadorship, if any man is in Christ... How do I get in Christ? Baptism of the Holy Spirit places me into Christ. That's a position that can never be removed nor destroyed. That's the, that's the story of the hands of Christ and God. Um, that's verse 17 of 2 Corinthians right there. God sees all unsaved. Here's the power of reconciliation. God sees all unsaved people at enmity with him. Because of Adam, not, not, not anything you do has nothing to do with your attitude. It has to do with your position at Adam. You're estranged from God. The only way you can get back to God is through his son. There's no other way. The only way you can get out of that bondage, no other way. There's no other way you can get out of Adam into Christ and into God. So, enmity is a key word. We're at enmity. And what happens is reconciliation, 
reconciliation exchanges the 13 judicial charges of Adam, enmity being one of them, alienated from God at enmity. That's a position that has nothing to do with attitude. It's a position when you believe the gospel, is able to rescue from that and transfer you over into the beloved kingdom, into, into the person of Jesus Christ. And, and, and what you get, reconciliation, is that ability to make that exchange. And what you get instead of enmity is peace with God. Do you understand? You have peace with God. That's important that you understand it. Back, if you, do you have Colossians still open? Look at Colossians. Look at Colossians uh, 1, 20, 21 to 22. Uh, we'll see another part of reconciliation. Through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, that's how secure your salvation is, and although you were formerly alienated and hostile, there's your word. See, that goes back to Genesis 3.15. Hostility, enmity goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15. And therefore engaged in evil deeds. Yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him, God, holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. See, that's a powerful idea. See, it's the, it's the blood of Christ. It's the work of Christ on the cross that rescues us and transfers us, and there's an exchange. For example, enemy, enmity is taken away, peace is replaced. Darkness to light, death to life, the exchange. See, there's always an exchange going on, right? Understand that. that and that exchange from that status of an Adam to a status in Christ is called reconciliation among many. It's called redemption. It's called reconciliation. It's called propitiation. There are nine communion factors engaged in it. Re reconciliation is only one. Reconciliation, all right? Reconciliation. Um, in Romans, I'm going to keep my place in. I want you to go to Romans a moment with me. Romans, the fifth chapter. Verse, uh, I'm going to start with verse 9, I'll, I'll go through 11. Much more than having now been justified, see that's one of those nine communion factors of the blood of Christ, like reconciliation, had, justificate, reconciled, redemption, justification, all that. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath, see that's propitiation, Safe from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, that's the, that's the same word as enmity. Enmity is a position. Enemy is a state. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Look how death and life, you know what death is? Christ, that's Christ on the cross. What is life? That's the res resurrection from the dead. Right? We got, listen, the guy, he took our death and he gave us his life. I mean, wow. That's an exchange. Is that not an exchange? And not only this, <laughs> don't you love that? Paul's going like, if that, and if that's not enough, how about this? I mean, that would have been enough. And not only this, but we also exult in God through the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. See, it's a gift. Reconciliation is not something you do to get it. It's not something you do to keep it. But it is something that is exercised to other people, isn't it? Through ambassadorship. Here's the second thing. Reconciliation is one of the 50 things in the package of grace salvation you can pick up at doctrinalstudies.com. In reconciliation, all that Christ removes and exchanged is remove and exchanged, listen to me, completely. See the, see the Greek word I have uh, uh, at the, up there where it says reconciliation, K-A-T-A-L-L, -L. see that word? 
Okay? Now listen to me. The word that, the word that is used in uh, Colossians, that 1, 20 through 22, and other places, has apo on the front of it. If you put an A-P-O on the front of that word, it means completely reconciled. Thoroughly reconciled. No doubts about it. Get that one? A powerful word. It's still translated, it's still translated in the English Bible as reconciliation, but it means absolutely reconciled. It means completely reconciled, thoroughly reconciled. No doubts about it. Not giving it in the front door, taking it out in the back. No strings attached. Whatever you might. When you add apo on the front of that word, it becomes enormous. And listen. Listen to this. Here's what this exchange means. Reconciliation gives us the exchange in reconciliation. Where God used to always... Here's how God sees the unbeliever, enmity. He's in a status, he's in a, in a position of enmity against him. You understand that? You believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are reconciled to God, and God only sees you as a believer at peace with him. That's what you get. In reconciliation, enmity is replaced, is replaced with the peace of God. That's the only way God sees you. It doesn't matter. Now, it's not the way we all, the rest of us may not see you that way. Right? Well, there goes a person at peace with God pulling their hair out. And, right? It's not how you see yourself. It's how you understand God sees you at all time. He sees you in Christ. He always sees you at peace with him. You may not be at peace with yourself. You may not be at peace with anybody else. But you're at peace with him. You know why? Because you had the good sense to believe the gospel of his son. And an exchange was made. The day you accepted Christ as your savior by believing the gospel, an exchange was made by grace. And you were gifted. You no longer have enmity you now have forever peace with God. Isn't that wonderful? How did you get that? Huh? How do you keep it? What do you mean, how do you keep it? It's how do you exercise it. It's not how you keep it. It's yours forever. Now, if you want the experience of it, you have the position. You want the experience? Fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.22.23 says the fruit of the Spirit is peace. You want the dynamics of that peace of God in your heart? You know what? You, when you want to start pulling your hair out, when you want to start climbing up the walls, all these other things that people talk about when you're out on the edge, you know what you can do? I don't care. You can be halfway climbing up the wall, halfway up, and you can find peace right there. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit who's in you, you can change, you can flip out by quit worrying and quit doing all that stuff that's got you full of anxiety. You can stop it in a heartbeat. It's your choice. The only person climbing up the wall is you. That's a flesh exercise. That's, a, that's an exercise of the flesh. You can stop walking in the flesh. You can walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. That's a choice you have. You don't have to keep going that way. You got, but you have, to, you have to turn it over to the Lord. You have to go like, you got to go to the Holy Spirit. You got to go like, I want the fruit of the Spirit. I want peace. And give it to you. He, he has no other. Listen, it, when you say, I want peace, you got it. 
He said, well, hey, here's how you get it. Stop walking up the wall. Stop for a minute. Pause and let God give you peace because out of peace will come a whole lot of good sense. Nothing good comes out of climbing up the walls and full of anxiety. Nothing good comes out of that. Got to repaint the walls. Nothing good comes out of that. One of the fruits of the Spirit. The, not the fruit of you, but the fruit in you of, is the power of the Holy Spirit. Exercise it. And you know how, what you have to do? You have to exercise it by faith. I believe it. God promised it. I claim it. It's done. And you go like, I know I did. I went. Hour later, I went, I don't know. I don't know that I got it. I said, well, how you, how's that last hour went? Pretty good, but I stopped climbing the wall. Well, what caused you to stop climbing the wall? And the father kept backing me up. I said, well, I said, Father, if, that's a, if that stuff's real, I need some real stuff. Hour later, and I hadn't thought about not climbing up the wall for an hour until an hour later. And I went, wow, I've gone a whole hour and I haven't climbed up a wall. How good is that? Wow, that thing really works. Who would have guessed? I'm just telling you how it works. Reconciliation is one of nine communion factors of the blood of Christ in the cup of the Eucharist. 1 Corinthians 11.25. See, we find that all over. I gave you passages like Romans, the fifth chapter, 10 and 11. Uh, Colossians 1, 20 through 22. Uh, Ephesians, the second chapter, 13 through 16. These are dynamite passages on reconciliation. You have reconciliation. You need to have the fruits of it. And you need to have the labor of it as an ambassador for Christ because the great message behind the gospel of Jesus Christ that we deliver as an ambassador is reconciliation. While there are nine things in the blood of Christ that's given to you, he said, listen, he tells you an ambassador, be sure you mention reconciliation. And so... There are three passages for you, ambassadors for Christ. Three key, key passages. If you're an ambassador for Christ sharing the gospel, reconciliation is a key doctrine. It's called the ministry of reconciliation. There are three key passages. Romans 5, 10 through 11. Colossians 1, 20 through 22. Ephesians 2, 13 through 16. Somewhere in the back of your Bible, they ought to be written down there. When you lead somebody to Christ, you're supposed to set them down and teach them that you just experienced reconciliation and exchange has been made. An ambassador has the ministry of reconciliation. Not just connection, but also information. A fourth, reconciliation replaces enmity with the peace of God. This is a great lesson that's brought out in Ephesians. I'll go to Ephesians before we wrap this thing up because I know we got to go home. Now in Christ Jesus, you who are formerly afar off, that's in Adam, have now been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who made both groups into one, Jews and Gentiles, broke down the barriers of the dividing wall, the sin barrier, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of the commandments uh, contained in ordinances, that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross by it having been put to death by having it by it having put to death enmity and he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near see that Should we not be living out in the Christian life the doctrine of reconciliation? What would that be, Ron? Peace. At peace. 
at peace with yourself, at peace with God, at peace in your marriage, at peace in your family, at peace at work, at peace. What part of your life are you not at peace with? How is that possible? You've been reconciled to a position of peace. God will do everything to arm, equip, and to see that you have peace in no matter what circumstances. Your circumstances should not dictate your peace, your position in Christ should. Come on now. If you think that your circumstances in life is where, where your happiness is, where your peace is, where your joy is, you're going to be a miserable Christian. Because it's not scriptural and God doesn't support that foolishness. That's the way the world thinks. That's not the way the church thinks. When an uns unsafe person believes that Jesus died for his sin, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, he get, not only does he get eternal life, but God's saving grace responds in reconciliation that is given from God his peace. God gives him peace. Brings him into a peace relationship. That is the peace relationship we should be living out in our lives every day. Let us pray. Oh, by the way, let me, down at the bottom of your paper, if you'd like, I got a couple of scriptures for you to write, and then we'll, we'll leave. This is about ambassadorship and reconciliation and peace. This is what a person needs to know. You know you were an enemy, and now you're at peace with God. And you'll always be at peace. It's a position based on grace. Two, two verses. Romans 10, Romans 10, 15, and Ephesians 6, 15. Ephesians 6, 15. And they both have something in common. Now, I'm not going to tell you. But they both have something in common that's important to ambassadorship. And you possess them today. What is necessary... You already have, you walked into church with them, even if you didn't have your Bible. So it could be a gate question. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for these that have come and have been such good students with us today. I'm a blessed man. A blessed pastor for sure. I pray the things we've discussed today from the Upper Room Discourse of the Last Supper would have bearing upon our life, Father, for what its intention was in the church and for us to be great ambassadors of the concept of Pemple. The Lord sends us to somebody that is in need of us and the message that we have of reconciliation to bring them into Christ, into God. What a privilege. I could tell you, Father, what a privilege. What a privilege for this old farmer from Podunk, Michigan. To be sent to this world as an ambassador of Christ. I couldn't have dreamed this up in a million years. I thank you for it. May, be, may I be faith, faithful, Father. May we as people be faithful. Until our coming to you or your coming to us. In Jesus' name, amen.